Chapter 11 Once I escaped from an underground hiding place by telling a story. It was a bit exaggerated, it was a bit fanciful, it was my imagination getting a bit carried away. It was a lie. Barney, I whisper, tugging his sleeve as he creeps up the cellar steps. He spins around, startled, and nearly drops his candle. He thought I was asleep, like the other kids. I need to come with you, I whisper. Barney frowns. I start to explain why I have to go with him. He puts his fingers on his lips and signals for me to follow him up the steps. I climb after him through the doorway in the ceiling and find myself in a huge room full of dusty old machinery. Barney puts his leather bag down, gently lowers the trap door and locks it with a padlock. He sees me looking around and points to the machinery. Printing presses, he says, for printing books. Not now, before. I know what he means. Before the Nazis went right off books and Jews. So, says Barney quietly, why do you need to come with me? I take a deep breath. I need to find my parents, I say, urgently, because of my rare illness. Barney thinks about this. He gives me a look that I'm fairly sure is sympathetic. This is going well. Mum and Dad have got my pills, I say. For my rare illness. If I don't take the pills, my rare illness will get worse and I could die. Barney thinks about this some more. What exactly is this rare illness? He asks. Suddenly I realise what he's concerned about. The other kids catching it and him. Don't worry, I say. It doesn't invade other people. Barney's eyes are twinkling in the candlelight. He almost looks amused. I feel indignant. People shouldn't be amused by other people's rare illnesses. If I don't find mum and dad and take those pills in the next two hours, I say, I'll get warts growing inside my tummy and my pee will turn green. I've stopped saying any more. I may have gone a bit too far already. Barney is actually smiling now. Zelda's right, he says. You are a good storyteller. Poop. I did go too far. Barney suddenly looks serious. She also told me, he says, that you haven't seen your parents for nearly four years. I feel myself blushing in the candlelight. What a stupid storytelling mistake. That was as stupid as Father Ludwig telling us that Adolf Hitler is a great man. Desperately, I try to think of a way to make the story better. Would Barney believe me if I tell him I only have to take the pills once every four years? Mm, I don't think so. This is pathetic. I can't tell a decent story to save my life anymore, or mum and dad's. Barney puts his hand on my shoulder and I wait to be escorted back down into the cellar. But that doesn't happen. Barney hands me the candle, picks up his bag and steers me towards the big rusty door in the wall of the printing factory. I'm glad you want to come with me, Felix, he says. Why? I say surprised. Barney, Barney suddenly looks very serious. I have to confess something, he says. I read one of the stories in your notebook. I stare at him, stunned. He doesn't seem like the sort of person who'd read private notebook without permission. I'm sorry, he says, but I wanted to find out what I could, what I could about your parents. Before I can say anything about my stories being dumb and not true, Barney grips my shoulder and looks me right in the eyes. You're a very good storyteller, he says. I don't know what to say. Before I can think of something, Barney goes on. The reason I'm glad you're coming with me, Felix, he says, is because I need your help. With, we pause in the doorway of the printing factory while Barney looks up and down the dark street. In the moonlight, I can see his leather jacket has a small hole in the back. I wonder if it's a bullet hole. Did Barney get shot once? Did his family? Is that why he's looking after other people's kids in a secret cellar? It might not be a bullet hole. Candle flame could have done it, or a rat. Barney might be a teacher or something. The Nazis might have burnt all the books in his school, so he brought some of the kids here to hide them. This is the dangerous part, whispers Barney, still squinting up and down the street. If anyone sees us leaving this building, we're sunk. Or he could have been a sailor. Come on, said Barney. All clear. Let's go. The streets of the city are filthy. Scraps of paper and rubbish everywhere. Some of the buildings have got 
bits of them missing. The whole place is deserted. I know it's night and everything, but we haven't seen a single person apart from a couple of dead bodies on a street corner. I manage not to cry. Barney makes us cross over to the other side. But it's all right. I've already seen them. They aren't mum and dad. Where are all the other people, I say? Indoors, says Barney. There's a curfew. That means everybody has to stay indoors after seven at night. We go down a narrow lane with tall apartment buildings on both sides. Can't see a single person through any of the windows. I read once that the cities have electric lights, but there doesn't seem to be much electricity going on around here. Finding mum and dad isn't going to be easy, even if I can slip away from Barney while he's concentrating on getting food. What happens if people don't do the curfew, I asked. They get shot, says Barney. I looked at him in alarm. I can tell from his voice he's not joking. He holds up his leather bag. We'll be all right, he says. I wonder what's in the bag. Money, maybe? Or something the Nazis need? I hope it's not guns they could use to shoot Jewish booksellers and change the subject. Why is there a curfew, I ask? Dad taught me to use every new word as much as possible after hearing it the first time. This is a ghetto, says Barney. It's part of the city where the Jews have been sent to live. The Nazis make the rules here. I think about this. Barney knocks on a door, and while we wait, he turns to me with a serious expression. Felix, he says, you might not be able to find your parents. I know that's a hard thing to hear, but you might not. It is a hard thing to hear. Luckily, he's wrong. The Jewish people who have been brought into the city, I say, are they all in this ghetto or are there other ghetto curfew places as well? Barney doesn't answer. Perhaps I didn't say the new word was right. A woman leads us into a back room in an apartment. There are several people in the room, all wearing coats and all standing around a bed. The man lying on the bed is wearing a coat too and holding his head and groaning. Lamp, please, says Barney. Somebody hands Barney an oil lamp. He bends over the bed and looks into the man's mouth. The man groans even louder. I glance at the other people. They don't look very well either, though none of them are groaning. Barney opens his bag and takes out a bundle of metal poles and leather straps. He fits the poles together using little metal wheels to make a kind of robot arm. From his bag, he takes the foot pedal from the Singer sewing machine, like Mrs. Glick used to have. He connects the poles to the pedal with leather straps. My imagination is in a frenzy. Is Barney going to show these people how to mend their clothes? Their coats are fairly ragged. Or is this machine that he's invented that helps people grow food in their own homes? There are lots of damp patches on the walls and these people do look very hungry. After all, this is 1942, so anything's possible. Salt water, says Barney. While a couple of people get water from the bucket, Barney attaches a short needle to the end of the robot arm and pedals the sewing machine thing with his foot. The straps make the needle spin around very fast with a loud humming noise. Suddenly, I realise what Barney has just put together. A dentist drill. Barney gives the man in the bed a glass of salty water and a metal bowl. Rinse and spit, he says. The man does. I stare in amazement. I take my glasses off and wipe them on my shirt and put them back on. Barney is a dentist. Mum went to the dentist once. Me and Dad met him in his, in his waiting room. He was very different from Barney. He was a thin, bald man with a squeaky voice who didn't do house calls. Felix, says Barney, over here, please. I jolt to attention. Barney wants me to help him. I've never been a dentist's assistant before. Will there be blood? I squeeze through the people until I'm next to Barney. He's taken the top off the lamp and he's holding the tip of the drill in the flame. Heat kills germs. I've read about that. Felix, says Barney, as he dips the drill into the water the man has spat into the bowl. Tell the patient a story, would you? The water bubbles as the drill cools. My brain is bubbling too with confusion. 
a story. Then I get it. When mum went to the dentist, she had an injection to dull the pain. Barney hasn't given this patient an injection. Times are tough and there probably aren't enough pain dulling drugs in ghetto curfew places. Suddenly my mouth feels dry. I've never told anyone a story to take their mind off pain. And when I told myself all those stories about mum and dad, I wanted to believe them. Plus, I didn't have a drill in my mouth. This is a big responsibility. Open wide, says Barney. He starts drilling. Go on, Felix, he says. The groans of the patient and the grinding of the drill and the smell of the burning from the patient's mouth make it hard to concentrate, but I force myself. Once, I say, a boy called William lived in a castle in the mountains, and he had a magic carrot. The patient isn't looking at Barney anymore. He's looking at me. If the boy held the carrot right, I go on, he could have three wishes about anything, including parents and cakes. Barney knocks on another door, a big door at the front of a big building. This one will be different, he says to me, but you'll be fine. I hope so, I say. My feet blisters are hurting and I'm a bit worried about the Nazi flag flapping over our heads. Barney puts his hand on my shoulder. He did a really good job back there, he says. Poor Mr. Grecky was in a lot of pain, but your story helped him get through it. Well done. I feel myself glowing, which I haven't done for years. Not since the last time I helped mum and dad dust the bookshelves and straighten up the fold down corners of pages. It's true. Mr. Grecky was very grateful. He and his family looked very sad when I asked them if they'd seen mum and dad, and they said they hadn't. The door opens. I nearly faint. Glaring at us is a Nazi soldier. Barney says something to him in Nazi language and points to our dentist bag. The soldier nods and we follow him in. As we climb some stairs, Barney whispers to me, This patient is German. Tell him a nice story about Germany. Suddenly, I feel very nervous. I don't know much about Germany. I think I read somewhere that it is completely flat and has a lot of windmills, but I could be wrong. I don't speak German, I mutter to Barney. Doesn't matter, says Barney. Say it in Polish and I'll translate. The soldier leads us into an upstairs room and I feel even more nervous. The patient is a Nazi officer, not the one who did the shooting when we arrived at the city, but he could be a friend of that one. He's sprawled in an armchair holding his face and when he sees us, scowls and looks like he's blaming us for his toothache. Barney sets up the drill. He doesn't ask for salt water. I think this is because the Nazi officer is swigging from a bottle. Whatever he's drinking smells very strong. He's doing a lot of rinsing, but no spitting. I don't understand. Why is Barney drilling a Nazi's teeth? And why doesn't the German Nazi army use its own dentists? Perhaps the officers don't like them because they're too rough and they use bayonets instead of drills. Barney picks up a lamp and looks inside the Nazi officer's mouth. That's amazing. I've never seen that before. The lamp is connected to a wire. It must be electric. Go on, Felix, says Barney. He wants me to start. My imagination goes blank. What story can I tell to a Nazi officer in a bad mood? I want to tell a story about how burning books and shooting innocent people makes a toothache worse, but I'd better not risk that. The soldier comes back in with a bulging cloth bag. Poking out the top is a loaf of bread with hardly any mould on it and some turnips and cabbage. Thank you, says Barney as he starts to drill. I understand. This is why we're giving the Nazi dentist Nazi dental treatment when he could be giving it to poor Jewish people to earn food. I think of the kids back in the cellar. I didn't tell them a story before, but I can tell them one for sure. I can tell them one for them now. Once, I say to the Nazi soldier, two brave German booksellers, I mean soldiers, were hacking their way through the African jungle. Their mission was to reach a remote African village to help mend uh, a windmill. Barney translates. I start making up the most exciting and thrilling story I can. 
with lots of vicious wild animals and poisonous insects who say nice things about Adolf Hitler. The Nazi officer seems to be interested. Well, he's not shooting anybody, but he could be at any moment. I try to stop the voice, my voice wobbling with fear. I want to do a good job so this patient will be as grateful as the last one was, so that afterward, when the drilling and the story are over, he'll feel warm and generous towards me. That's when I ask him if he knows where my mum and dad are.